Hey everyone, Pastor Gabe from Stone Mountain Baptist Church here. Uh, just doing a quick uh, recap video, if you will, from last week's sermon on Daniel chapter 7. Uh, unfortunately, <laughs> I was a little helpful and I grabbed the mic uh, ahead of time for the audio capture on the uh, phone that we use to record our sermons. And unfortunately, it did not sync with Bluetooth. So we had video, but no audio. Uh, so I'm not going to preach another 50-minute sermon here uh, by any means, but because it's such a uh, essential passage for the rest of the book and understanding the future sermons that are coming, I thought I'd just do a quick short recap of a couple of the, the main points. Um, just to, to sort of highlight that, make sure we have it in mind if it's a help to you. Uh, as you look at sort of the remaining um, passages uh, that are to come. Uh, so it's my hope to uh, be able to hit that for you real quick and just be an encouragement to you uh, that they may be listening to this or watching this uh, that wasn't able to be there last week. So uh, Daniel 7 is, like I said a second ago, a bit of a hinge in the middle of the story of Daniel. Uh, the first six chapters are, are primarily narrative. It's a uh, historical account of the period of 70 years that Daniel is in captivity, uh, basically uh, leading up from the siege of Jerusalem, the Babylonian captivity, then being taken away to Nebuchadnezzar's uh, court and palace, and then ultimately all the way through to the ending of the Babylonian Empire with uh, Cyrus uh, defeating uh, Belshazzar and Nebuchadnezzar, uh, which is at the conclusion of chapter 5. Daniel 6 then gives us a narrative under uh, Darius or Darius with the story of the lion's den. And chapter 7 switches now and focuses primarily on uh, prophecies and visions and apocalyptic literature, really. So Daniel is kind of an interesting book that half of it is sort of a narrative with visions mixed in and interpretations, very similar to like Joseph interpreting Pharaoh's dreams. Uh, whereas the second half is is primarily these vision accounts uh, that comprise of the beasts and the goats and the rams and the <laughs> 70 weeks and so on. Uh, so Daniel 7, I titled the sermon, The Little Horn, the Son of Man, and the Ancient of Days. Uh, but ultimately what we're looking at with this passage is uh, the picture or the vision, I should say, of the four beasts. Uh, these are basically um, direct, directly correlated to the statue that we saw in Daniel chapter 2. Uh, noticing the videos flickering, the brightness a little bit. So uh, pardon my mild annoyance. I don't have a fancy studio here, but uh, but I'll do my best. But, uh, but the four beasts are directly correlating to the uh, statue in Daniel chapter 2. So the head of gold, uh, the, the chest of silver, the thighs of uh, bronze, and the legs of iron with the feet of iron mixed with clay. Um, previously, I argued that uh, the interpretations, for the most part, there in Daniel 2, but, but extended throughout, uh, that that refers to ultimately the Babylonian Empire, the Medo-Persian Empire, the Greek Empire, and the Roman Empire. And I argued that the, the uh, clay mixed into the Roman Empire is not sort of a, a future fragmented resurging Roman Empire, as, as some people may believe. Uh, but I think that actually rather uh, spoke to the Herodian dynasty and the mixture of the Jewish uh, sort of kingdom with Israel and sort of this mixed kingdom that existed at the time of Christ. So again, I believe the visions in Daniel are primarily messianic visions pointing to ultimately the coming of the Messiah, uh, who will give a sacrifice and cut off all sacrifices from then forth. Uh, and then also uh, pointing towards the destruction of the Judaic age with AD 70 and Jerusalem, which we see a lot of in this passage today. Uh, with the little horn, etc. So I'll be making uh, some fun arguments here. So the four beasts correspond directly to that statue. So the first beast uh, is ultimately represented, we see later in the interpretation, that it is in fact uh, referring to Nebuchadnezzar and Babylon. Uh, so the first beast uh, is essentially uh, uh, a beast who is uh, flying about and that is brought low and then is lifted up and given the heart of a man, which is exactly what happened to Nebuchadnezzar. He was this mighty man who esteemed himself and exalted himself, who was brought low, made to uh, eat <laughs> eat like an ox and have the, the dew of heaven, so to speak, pass over him for seven periods of time, whether that be seven years, seven months, either way, long enough time that his uh, his fingernails grew and his, his hair grew and he was a wild looking man. So uh, this first one is pretty straightforward. The first beast is referring to Nebuchadnezzar and to his kingdom. The second beast is, I believe, uh, pretty easy as well. Follows that same pattern as Medo-Persia. 
uh, Medo-Persia. So one thing that's interesting about the ribs that are in its mouth that it's devouring, um, you can see that obviously as, as a picture of conquest. Uh, Media was the uh, primary empire, and then Persia sort of swallowed it up. We'll see next week in the Sermon in Daniel 8 that that's, I believe, what the larger horn on the ram is symbolic of, is Persia swallowing up uh, media in that in that empire. Um, but ribs are also uh, a picture in scripture of, uh, you know, people, humans, uh, family. So Eve is made from the rib of Adam, for example. Uh, so uh, some commentators actually speculate, and I think it's, uh, it's an interesting correlation, that the three ribs actually refer to the three Jewish officials uh, who were in the various parts of the Persian Empire. Daniel himself, uh, and then also uh, Mordecai and Esther under Asuarius, which is Xerxes the uh, first, and then also Nehemiah, who is a cupbearer, uh, cupbearer to Artaxerxes. Uh, so I think that's an interesting extension of what's talking about with the ribs there. Uh, ultimately, then the next beast, this flying uh, leopard-like uh, beast, is referring to, I believe, Alexander the Great, who is the leader of the Macedonian Empire, the Greek Empire. Uh, what's interesting about Alexander, we'll see him more again in next chapter in much more detail. Uh, with the with the goat with the sharp horn, uh, but uh, he was fierce, conquered much, and ultimately was cut off at the uh, the young age of 32. Um, but I believe the picture here with the beast is pretty straightforward. It has four wings. Uh, ultimately, the Greek Empire was split into four empires after uh, after Alexander the Great's death, and so the four uh, four wings there I believe represent the four. Uh, portions of the empire, and we'll see that again more in detail in chapter 8. And then ultimately this last beast that's unique and more terrifying than any of them, uh, which has ten horns that spring up and then one horn amongst them that is boastful and full of words, uh, I believe this speaks clearly to uh, the Roman Empire. Uh, the Roman Empire, and I believe the ten horns symbolize the Caesar dynasty. There was ten Caesars from Julius to Vespasian, and who uh, took the throne in 69 AD, uh, and ultimately was one who oversaw the sacking and destroying of Jerusalem. Uh, so I believe that's speaking to the line of Caesars, and that ultimately uh, that that's uh, pretty symbolic of also the beast we see in Revelation, uh, with seven heads and ten horns on it, and the harlots riding upon it. I think that harlot speaks to. Uh, Israel ultimately, uh, who's riding upon the the seven uh, seven headed beast with its with its Caesars, this mixed kingdom again, uh, and we see this sort of the picture is that Rome um, historically or mythologically, depending on how you want to look at it, uh, was founded by Romulus and six other kings. So, uh, so the Roman Empire was founded by seven kings, and it was known as a city on seven hills. So, what's interesting about the Roman Empire, and I think part of the reason why it's it's such a blasphemy. Uh, to a holy God is that seven is also the number <clears throat> of perfection that God uh, oftentimes we see associated with the seven days of the week. Um, and we see seven excellencies oftentimes attributed to Christ, particularly in the book of Revelation. Uh, so the fact that Rome is in a sense an antichrist, a uh, a competitor to God's glory on a large scale, I think is what's in picture there. <clears throat> so with that in mind, um, the, the beast here is clearly Rome. Uh, and I believe that it corresponds directly to uh, parts that we see in, in the Olivet Discourse, but also in uh, the book of Revelation. And just to sort of tip my cards ahead of time, uh, my interpretation of Revelation, while I do believe it has recapitulations, uh, where it's retelling some of the same events repeatedly from different perspectives, uh, the world doesn't get destroyed multiple times, right? Uh, I believe that the all of it discourse is missing from John's uh, epistle, uh, John's gospel, I should say, uh, because the book of Revelation, I believe, is John's all of it discourse, basically, in long detail. So uh, if this is a new perspective that you haven't heard before, uh, I hold to what's called partial preterism. Really, all Christians are partial preterists at some point. You believe some uh, prophecies have been fulfilled in the past, preterist before. Uh, partial preterists, though, or, or people that take a preterist interpretation of the Olivet Discourse or the Book of Revelation, not in its entirety, but the first 20, 20 chapters, um, would essentially argue that the majority of what's being discussed here is ultimately the destruction of Jerusalem, the ending of the Old Covenant, uh, and the beginning of the church militant, the kingdom of God on earth. Jesus came to preach uh, the kingdom of God. And so we would see a lot of these events not as something that is in a far future, but something that actually happened within the very generation that Jesus said it would. Uh, 
a lot of people have different interpretations about how to see that, but the most plain interpretation of saying this generation will not pass away is indeed to believe that it did not pass away without these events coming to transpire. Now, obviously, that raises a lot of questions about, well, how does that all work? And, you know, wars and rumors of wars, etc. cetera. Uh, what about, you know, the Olivet Discourse where it talks about, uh, you know, two being in the field, etc.? Uh, well, there's a lot of stuff we can get into in the future here and some sermons coming, um, but, but just a brief uh, couple of observations. One, uh, it, it's interesting that it's noted, uh, it says, you know, what do you, if, if it happens, let it not be on a Sabbath day. Uh, well, if there's no nation of Israel, really, and, and today it's arguably uh, still no nation of Israel, right, in the proper sense, uh, then why would there be a warning, hope it's not on a Sabbath day? No one honors the Sabbath, really. Even in the church and the Reformed tradition, we don't honor the Sabbath day as much as we should. So uh, that's an interesting warning that seems to indicate that it talked about uh, the Judaic age still, right? The time when the temple sacrifice was still happening. Uh, there's some other really interesting things of note about the year in which uh, the temple was completed under Herod in 67. Uh, it's also the, the year that Nero died, right? So there's some interesting things that happened, but ultimately the fleeing to the hills and the destruction that came in the wars and rumor of wars, I do believe uh, ties directly to the chaos that erupted when Nero died uh, in AD 67. And we had the sort of short year or 18 months or so of four different Caesars in a rapid succession before Vespasian took the throne in 69. Uh, wars and rumors of wars was a big deal when you're living under the Pax Romana, a time of, of relative peace, really, for a, quite a long period of time. Uh, so I think that speaks highly to what's uh, happening there. Uh, and so something we need to take into account. So the Ten Horns, right, I've already made the argument that uh, the Ten Horns represents the Caesars, uh, at least the first ten Caesars, I should say, up to uh, AD 70. Uh, so what is the little horn that comes up, rises up amongst them, speaking blasphemies? Well, if you notice, it talks about the horn rising up and three being cut off or being plucked up uh, before it. Uh, so I believe this is speaking to Nero. Nero was the sixth Caesar in the line of ten on the way from Julius down to, uh, down to uh, Vespasian. And the three that came before him all died untimely deaths. Uh, one was poisoned by his own wife. Uh, another was uh, assassinated, right, Caligula. Uh, so there was, there was multiple uh, rulers and Caesars that died before him to make way for him to come up. Uh, Nero also was a blasphemer who esteemed himself. He was wild, known for persecuting the Christians. And I believe he is uh, primarily who is in play here with regards to the Great Tribulation uh, that persecuted the church, speaking blasphemies against God and his people, uh, literally lighting them on fire in his garden parties for fun, feeding them to uh, his, you know, his troops and the wild animals at the Circus Maximus in the, in the Colosseum, right? So uh, this man was obviously a terrible man. Now, uh, the Antichrist and the abomination and desolation, there are other passages that are wildly speculated about and many interpretations for. Uh, I'm going to make an argument in chapter 8 next, next week that largely Antiochus IV, a descendant down the line from uh, the Greek Empire, is who's being spoke of there uh, in those passages, uh, but that he was also a precursor pointing forward to Nero and some of the things that he would do. Uh, again, just to tip my cards a little bit, Antiochus, uh, actually, when he um, went in and fought against Rome, went in and set up a altar to Zeus and slaughtered a pig in the temple in Jerusalem. So, uh, but the ultimate blasphemy you can you could commit in that time. So, uh, a lot of things to be considered there. But I do think that primarily when it's talking about uh, Antichrist and some of these different figures that we see, that we are looking at figures that have uh, already come and gone, um, but that principally there are still a spirit of Antichrist, as John talks about in his epistles, uh, that exists to this day. That any time someone denies the Son comes from the Father and, and lives in a way that is contrary to the gospel, antagonistic to the gospel, there is still a spirit of Antichrist that, uh, that remains. But that the uh, figures of the majority of these visions and the way that they work themselves out have been ultimately fulfilled in a way that I believe esteems Christ as the great high prophet that he is. So ultimately, I would make the argument that Nero is uh, that little horn. Um, what's interesting about Nero as well, people will be like, well, what about the, the passage in Revelation that seems to correlate 
uh, talking about the him having a mortal wound and then resurrecting. So what's interesting about Nero is that he actually, uh, when he died, there was a whole cult following that believed he would be resurrected and come back to rule. Even hundreds of years later, under St. Augustine's time, he uh, uh, <laughs> he actually was was talking about some of these uh, these Nero worshippers. Uh, Nero is also interesting. There's there's argument to be made that the the number six 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 is actually a, a uh, essentially a a, wor- a riddle uh, that speaks to the spelling of of Caesar Nero or Nero Caesar, uh, depending on whether you're you're going from uh, the Hebrew or the Greek. Uh, it works out. What's it, which is interesting that actually accounts for the textual variant because depending on which language you start to work out the numeric puzzle, each letter equaling a number in the uh, the numbering system of the day, uh, depending on which language you start with, you'd get either six 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 or six one six, which is interesting because that's typically uh, where the the some of the manuscripts vary on that particular thing. So, again. Uh, this might be a new perspective for, for those of you that are listening, but I'd make the argument that it's very important for us to consider these things, uh, not because we have no um, no fear for uh, future tribulation or that the Christian life is all to be warm and rosy and that we're just going to march onward towards victory with no pain, um, but that we have to have hope in the kingdom of God expanding like the mustard seed that he promised it would be in his parables. Uh, so we have hope that Satan has defe- uh, been defeated, uh, that he has been bound, and that he is ultimately under lock and chain, roaming about, yes, like a roaring lion, but only as far as the leash will let him go, uh, so that the church might be advancing forward. Um, so that's uh, there, there's my position there on that. Um, but, but the thing I want to focus on just for a few minutes before I wrap this up that is probably the most important in this passage is the amazing picture of the Son of Man rising to the Ancient of Days in a cloud. And we see that ultimately in the ascension of Christ in Acts. We see this phrase, the Son of Man. It's important to note that that's uh, primarily a title used by Ezekiel throughout his uh, throughout his book, and Ezekiel was a contemporary uh, just prior to Daniel, so it's very possible that Daniel was even familiar with, with uh, Ezekiel's prophecies. But uh, Ezekiel refers to himself or is, is called the Son of Man throughout that book. And what's interesting about Ezekiel is that Jesus has proven to be a greater Ezekiel over and over and over. It's interesting. Ezekiel has visions of beasts as well, but the beasts he has visions of are actually the cherubim around the throne of God. Um, Jesus is a greater Ezekiel, though, because uh, what's interesting is you see a correlation. They were both baptized at 30, uh, given a message of judgment on a generation. Uh, Ezekiel 24 captures that. Uh, Babylon conquers Jerusalem and his wife dies. This is Ezekiel. Uh, Rome destroys uh, the bride of Yahweh itself, uh, itself, Israel. Uh, we see a judgment issued to the nations in Ezekiel 25 to 32. Jesus handles apostate Israel, so to speak, goes on conquest of the whole earth through the Great Commission. So Ezekiel is given a vision of heavenly Jerusalem. Jesus preached the fulfillment of this kingdom of God. Uh, Jesus is the greater son of man. Jesus is the greater Ezekiel. Uh, so if you want to understand uh, Jesus um, speaking of the kingdom, look at the prophecies of Ezekiel and see them fulfilled in Christ. Uh, but the important thing here to look at is the ascension. Uh, they looked up and saw him going. Notice that it says he he uh, came up to the Ancient of Days, the throne of God, the Ancient of Days, uh, came up to. So oftentimes we see this cloud language, and we assume it's speaking to the return of Christ. Right Now the angel does say you'll see him uh, return the same way that he went. Um, But when it talks about rising up, I believe this is speaking to the ascension of Christ. He rises to sit at the right hand of of God from where he will (laughs) uh, sit and come to judge the quick and the dead ultimately. Christ is ruling and reigning right now. And if you don't believe that, I want to challenge you this morning that even if there's trouble in the world, um, God sovereignly superintends all things. He worked about all of human history, and it's a huge takeaway from this text, is that God literally shaped massive empires. Some of the most powerful human organizations and governments and kingdoms that have ever existed, God shaped them to bring about his Messiah, to bring about Jesus Christ, born of a virgin, at exactly the right year, at exactly the right time, at exactly the pace that we would expect from Daniel's prophecy in Daniel chapter 9, about the 70 weeks until this one comes, this Messiah comes to cut off uh, and be cut off for his people. Uh, So powerful, powerful things that actually speak not only to God's sovereignty in human history, but also to the fact that God can use anything. So whatever bad things might be happening in the world, whatever bad things might be happening in your life, God can use them for his purposes to bring them about for good. 
uh, just brings to mind the story of Joseph, right? What you meant for evil, God meant for good. Meant for good. Not simply he can make the best of it, but he genuinely intended it. That this is what needed to be uh, so that he might bring about his plan of salvation uh, for all who believe. And that's good news, my friends. Uh, so the Ancient of Days uh, that Jesus is ascending to, right, obviously is the throne of God. He is the ruler yet. Uh, just a few passages that correspond. The Olivet Discourse, Matthew 24, 30 says, And then shall appear the Son of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of the Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Uh, so there's a picture here of ascension, uh, but there's also a picture of judgment, right? Uh, and so many would, would articulate the destruction in AD 70 as a spiritual return of Christ in authority to carry out the judgment of tearing down the temple brick by brick, stone by stone. Uh, as he did. And we can make more on that in future sermons and arguments, but at the end of the day, God does use human instruments to carry out his judgments. Revelation 1-7 says, Behold, he cometh with clouds, every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him, even so. Amen. Uh, and then Psalm 2-8 uh, says, Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen of thine inheritance in the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. I want to challenge and say ultimately that um, I don't think Jesus forgot to ask when he ascended. I do think he asked for the nations and that he will save uh, many, right? Not every single soul that walks the earth. Uh, I don't believe that we're going to have a utopian age to the point where literally every soul on earth is saved. But I do believe that the gospel will go forth, that just as that vision uh, in Daniel 2 uh, shows that our church is named after, whoa, nope, camera's backwards, that our church is named after, <laughs> uh, that the stone that is not cut with hands comes and smashes that great statue of all those kingdoms, all those idols, all those mighty men who thought they were great and wonderful, and that rock grows to a great mountain that covers the whole earth. And so our church hopes to be just one stone in that great mountain uh, that is the church of God, the heavenly Jerusalem, the new Eden, if you will. Uh, and we look forward to a day when we'll be consummated in glory, when we'll be removed from our sinful states, given glorified bodies, resurrected and reunited with our God for all eternity. Uh, but in the meantime, we are the church moving forward, advancing forward. It says the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church of God. And if you think about that, that means we're on the offensive. That doesn't mean hell is marching towards us and we have our shields up. They have the battering rams. Quite the opposite, my friends. We bring forth the gospel. We preach to the nations. And by God's grace, hell is battered down with each blow of God's word being delivered and by the effectual call of the Holy Spirit, people being saved. Praise be to God. Uh, so I want to encourage you uh, that Jesus is ruling and reigning. He is calling people to himself. He is the Son of Man who has been ascended, who has been resurrected, who sits uh, at the right hand of the, uh, the throne of God, who rules and reigns forever with all authority and power. Uh, and so I closed with a couple of um, applications that I just want to share with you uh, in closing uh, right now as well. Um, one, as I've already argued, that God ordains everything that comes to pass. And that includes all, uh, all working of human history to bring about the Messiah. First and foremost, God ordains, providentially superintends all of history so that his will will be carried out for his glory and for our good. That is good news. God is the one true God. All other gods are false gods. They do not survive the trial of the false gods, if you will. Uh, he declares the end from the beginning. Isaiah 46 tells us, Isaiah 40 through 45 has all these passages about how all these other gods are not truly God, but God is. Uh, so this idea that Isaiah 43, for example, uh, there is no gods before me, neither were there any after me. I alone am Savior, right? God is the one true God, and that is good news. But uh, the, the second thing I want to drive home uh, for you in this video is simply this, that uh, God does ordain everything that comes to pass. <sighs> And that if he can rise up empires uh, of the world to both chastise and protect his people, uh, to bring about Messiah, how much more can he use light and momentary afflictions in your life? Suffering upon suffering through the Old Testament, yet through all their suffering, uh, we have the suffering servant who is pierced for us, who bore our stripes. Jesus 
ultimately suffered uh, at the end of this giant chain of human events that God ordained so that he might live the life that we could not live, die the death that we deserve, so that through his death, burial, and resurrection, us placing our faith in his resurrected life, we might be united to him by the Holy Spirit, and that union with Christ would make us uh, holy before God, even though uh, we are not blameless. We are full of sin and iniquity. But our repentance, turning from our sin, trusting in Jesus Christ alone in faith by the grace and and meritless work that we've contributed in the perfect work of Christ, uh, that we look to that and that we know that Jesus will save us and he will raise us up on the last day as he has promised. Uh, All of that, if God can orchestrate Babylon and Greece and Rome and the Caesars, right? If he can orchestrate all of that to bring about salvation for the lost, he can also take your sickness your loss of a loved one, your financial troubles, your job that you want to get but you have not been granted, all of those things, God will use them for good. Your suffering is merely God's sanctifying work in you. If God has not granted you the petition that you have so earnestly desired and sought after, I want to encourage you to not waste those trials, but rather to learn from them what God wants you to learn. Trust in the fact that God will use everything and that he ordains everything that comes to pass. Whatsoever comes to pass, as our uh, confession says, uh, that's a beautiful, beautiful picture of God's grace and sovereignty. Some might liken God to some sort of tyrant who's just playing with dolls and that we're a bunch of robots. But what it actually means is that God, in his divine wisdom, knows what's best for us. And he will work things out so that we are drawn to him. And that means sometimes that he does allow us or even cause us to endure hardship so that we might learn to trust in him. So that we might learn to trust in him. So I want to encourage you that if the God who gave Daniel these visions of these great beasts, massive beasts devouring whole nations, if that God knows that Jesus is the true king who's going to crush all of them. And that God is not only the God who ordains all these things, but loves you enough to send his only beloved son, his only begotten son, to die for us who believe. Then we should rest and trust in him in whatever we are experiencing, knowing that he will bring about good as he seems fit, as he sees fit. And that is truly good news. Uh, So a couple of last conclusions. Uh, Men, especially, I want to speak to you real quick. Men, lead like God has actually ordained your life. Lead in such a way that you believe that God has given you purpose and that that purpose is meaningful and that he has given you something worthy to fight for, to protect, and to provide for. And I want to encourage you to not be lazy or complacent, to sit back on your laurels saying, Jesus has fought the good fight, so there's nothing left for me to fight. Rest in his victory and march forward as good soldiers of God. Don't sit back, don't be lazy, don't be full of sloth, but rather lead with conviction because God has ordained your steps, and if he has ordained your steps, you have a good path before you, so go walk it. Ladies, I want to speak to you real quick as well. I want to encourage you to overcome the fear and anxiety that you are often prone to. Uh, It's not that men don't have fear and anxiety, but I've noticed with my sisters in Christ particularly uh, that this is an area um, that just by nature, you know, it's natural uh, that you struggle with. So I want to encourage you to not be anxious because God has ordained your life. What you experience, the troubles that you uh, endure, the pain that you endure, the sin that you commit, the sin that you have committed against you, all these things God has ordained, allowed, permitted, constructed, shaped so that you might be, uh, be the woman, ultimately, you ladies, that God wants you to be, that you might be drawn closer to him. So, men, lead well, ladies, fear not, and let's both walk forward as we as the church seek to build the kingdom of God that is so gloriously depicted throughout the book of Daniel that all these kingdoms think they are great, but the kingdom of God is mightier yet. And as a last uh, reminder and sort of application for the whole world, that even the civil realm, the kings of the day, will bow the knee ultimately to Christ. So fear not, brothers and sisters. Jesus is ruling and reigning. He's on the throne. Uh, and we'll, we'll look at continued amazing prophecies in the weeks to come uh, as we look at Daniel chapter 8 and work our way towards the end of the book. Uh, so I hope this brief recap was helpful. And we look forward to uh, hopefully seeing you on the Lord's Day here in Nampa, Idaho at 10 a.m. at the American Legion Building. If you're in the area, we'd love to have you visit. And for those of you that are uh, watching abroad, um, 
it's very humbling and amazing to see uh, that God can use even uh, just a little ministry in the middle of uh, you know, Podunk, Idaho, uh, <laughs> uh, to reach reach out there. So may God bless you, and I pray that uh, you'd have hope and peace uh, in the Lord Jesus Christ and his victory on the cross on your behalf. So rest in him, walk in him, and uh, have a good week. And whenever you listen to this, uh, go to church this Lord's Day. Go worship with the saints. Go batter down the gates of hell with your brothers and sisters. Grace and peace.